markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. What's up, traders? Welcome to episode 214, featuring repeat guest James King. It was 2017 when I actually first spoke with James. That was on episode 133. And it was shortly after he had left a London-based commodity trading firm where he had worked as performance director. Since then, he has continued advising to proprietary traders and fund managers, specialist military units and professional sports teams, as well as a few exclusive organizations, while also presenting case studies on elite performance at various Ivy League universities. More recently, though, James has put the final touches on his first published book titled Accelerating Excellence, in which he reveals four foundational principles that have been proven to drive elite performance. And it's these four principles that serve as the focal point for our chat today, as James takes time to carefully explain each one. I'm sure some of you will note James is a rather fast talker at points, so I might suggest you give this a second listen as I'm sure you'll miss some gold the first time through. Now, regarding James's book, if you're listening to this episode fresh, then you can pre-order, or if you're listening to this episode at a later date, then you can purchase by going to chatwithtraders.com slash James. This link will redirect you straight to Accelerating Excellence on Amazon. All right, team, on with the show now. I'm pleased to present to you for a second time, James King. I don't know if this is a good question to start with. It might be a silly question. If it is, just tell me and we can move on. But (laughs) as it's obviously the, the main focus of our conversation, and you've written an entire book on the subject. I thought I'd just ask you off the bat, what is excellence? I would define excellence as the, the quality of being outstanding. And, and I often use the phrase uh, to describe what my objective, accelerating excellence. So by accelerating, I mean to increase in rate, amount, or extent the quality of being outstanding where and i think it's a really good question you've asked there because so many people um are obsessed with performance enhancement but but not many of them actually define it i think it's really important to understand at a top level let's define the thing we want to improve and, and the word performance is another really important one and i break it down into three key, key areas so the first construct for me is quality or completeness. So for instance, um, a gymnastic at the Olympic Games scoring 10 out of 10 is a more complete performance than scoring a nine. Um, and that's traditionally where we, where we focus when we talk about performance. But then there's two other really important constructs to measure. And the second one is cost. So again, cost, there's, there's, that could come in a numerous forms. So we've got, uh, time, finances, resources, effort, willpower. You know, if we can get that gymnast to get a perfect 10 with 3,000 hours worth of training versus 6,000 hours of training, then we've um, theoretically reduced cost and maintained performance. And then the third construct, which you think is, again, equally important is speed. So speed is that time from initiating that um completion of a given task to the actually accomplishment to the accomplishment of that. And then within that speed dimension, you might also look at repeatability. So can I, can I repeat that performance on demand? Uh, And that's a really important one. So performance overall defined as uh, the accomplishment of a given task, whether that's making 50 million uh, profit as a, as a trader or winning X gold medals as a team GB athletic squad measured against uh you know across time and then another one i'll even normally chuck in there as well is the word human and you know i always talk about human performance because in the context of the work i do i'm not talking about the synthetic or technological aspects so for instance 
uh, AI, weapon systems. Um, it, it's really on the human. And, and where I'm working is on the psychological and biological factors that we all have control of and ultimately operates the weapon, the technology, it, or, or even designs it in the first place. So that was, sorry, Aaron, that was probably quite a long-winded answer. That's absolutely perfect. It does answer my question. And I think it's it's good just to clarify before we sort of delve into things too far. So one of the the first questions I wanted to ask you, besides that one I just did, in your book, you know, towards the beginning of it, one of the things you kind of go into is ambition, hard work, and talent is not necessarily the complete equation. So I'd like to ask you, like, where do we often go wrong when it comes to understanding what drives excellence? Yeah, another great question. I mean, look, in the majority of organizations or or individuals I've worked with, it's very, very unusual that uh, ambition, talent or effort is is the problem. Um, You know, humans have been striving to get better faster since the beginning of time, whether that's like, you know, cavemen racing to light fires or scientists competing to create the first COVID vaccine. I I think everyone has the drive to excel in, in one area or another. Um, And I think one of the key issues is that whilst we're born with this incredible adaptable machine, the human brain and body, we aren't born with the software to channel um, those resources we all possess optimally. And some of us also struggle activating those resources. Um, So so the things we talk about with with regard to confidence, motivation, resilience, this psychological firepower exists within us all. And I'd say the two two problems I see are that people struggle to activate it in the first place, or they struggle to channel those resources in order to to return and um, return on on their investment of effort, talent, time. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, a lot of a big part of my role, or anyone in a leadership role, I think, in any organisation, is that at certain points in time, individuals or organisations are maximally responsive to certain types of training. And we want to uh, ensure that we're selecting and investing those resources in the areas or with the interventions that will generate that biggest return on investment um, in terms of time and effort. So, so, yeah, it tends not to be ambition. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, where do we, where do we kind of go wrong there? Because, you know, it's, it's interesting actually, because if I think about, the traders I speak with or, you know, maybe someone who listens to the podcast who sends me an email sometime, uh, you know, I think most of those people are naturally ambitious, willing to put in the hard work. I mean, the talent, I feel like, is something which maybe uh, they develop as they go on, hopefully. So, yeah, obviously there is kind of a, a missing piece to the equation there. Yeah. Do you think it's, is there anything within our, Obviously, we're going to go into some principles about how to move forward, but is there something like mindset wise which we think about which you think is maybe flawed in some way? I know you've got a bit of an issue with like the 10,000 hour rule and you kind of spoke about a bit of an issue. Yeah. I've okay. got severe issues with that, but yeah, <laughs> no, no, you're, you're bang on. And, and again, I'm really glad that we're actually sort of setting the foundations right by actually look, look let's look at how we look at this whole uh, improvement process full stop from 30,000 feet. And then we can sort of zero in on, on some of the tangibles that you can actually do. But yeah, you're right. I mean, look, trading and investing particularly you look at the uh, the horsepower cognitively in terms of IQ, conscientiousness, industriousness. These are like psychological gold in terms of performance, these traits. And, and, and the industry attracts some of the, the hardest working, brightest people out there. But there's a few problems that I see, you know, and I'll, I'll go through them. Um, the first one is, I think, when with improvement, where a lot of people go wrong is they reason by analogy. So they attempt to innovate by copying the recipes of others, falling for sales pitches, or leaning on uh, best practice that's approved by the majority. Um, what we should do, as Elon Musk uh, is always preaching, is reason by first principles. So we need to break our problems down into their basic elements and then reassemble them from the ground up. Uh, and this allows us to eliminate careless reasoning, copy-pasting, and inadequate analogies to emerge with opportunities that, that others will miss. 
And I think this is um, the case in human performance. Now, unlike physics or maths, the foundational principles that drive elite performance aren't, aren't popularized. I mean, we, we know why, as a human performance guy, like we know why people excel. We know the mechanisms. We know the principles that drive that. It's not a secret. And it always amazes me at how, um, how almost secret or, or reserved or the, these principles are. And that's one of my objectives with writing the book is to like, look, well, I'm going to give people the foundational principles so that they can, instead of just copy pasting other people, can start to solve their own unique problems with their own bespoke solutions. So that's, that's, a where, that's where a lot of people go wrong. I'd say the second thing I see that is cripples many people is that we are programmed or our nature is to think in a linear fashion. So we expect progress to be relatively constant with the effort we, we invest. Uh, almost a straight line from bottom left to top right with progress versus effort, time, money, investment. Um, and it's not. It, it's very much an exponential process. So when you expect it to be linear and it turns out it's not, unsurprisingly, I th- uh, you know, so many people experience frustration and disappointment at how ineffective their effort seems to be. And, and, and inevitably, many people decide to give up. Um, also, you know, if you can't see a straight line to the top, some of us just don't bother to try but the fact is that it it takes one breakthrough to enable you to perceive the possibility of the next and you know there's a compounding effect with each bout of progress and you know our inability to sometimes think exponentially in terms of our progress is what causes so many people to stay blind to the uh, what is essentially enormous amount of um latent potential or opportunity that exists within 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 us um yeah i think that perception of potential is, is a big es- issue when you don't perceive the pot- there's, there's much potential it inevitably affects the effort um the quality of the effort you put in and the quantity that obviously impacts results that then reinforces and it become it can become a negative spiral. Uh, and then vice versa is when you perceive these like enormous perceptions of potential, um, the, the effort with regard to quality and quantity, again, they just go through the roof. And then, you know, so do results. And then, again, we get that upward spiral. So that's another key one I see a lot of people go wrong. Uh, and then the last one I'll make, the last point I'll make there, links a bit to the sort of reasoning by analogy, but... But the reality is that when, when we observe elite performance, you know, we see uh, it's, it's DiCaprio on stage collecting his Oscar. It's uh, Elon launching his new Cybertruck or Tesla Roadster or the athlete on the podium or, or you know, it's Paul Tudor Jones uh, just just hit some ridiculous or insane profit target. And, and we just see we only ever see excellence when the expert is finished. So we, we sort of grow up with this movie version of success. Not many of us go grow up or, or spend any time at all around around elite performance um, through the through the journey. Uh, so we only ever see a, a fraction of what excellence really entails. And that's a problem. And I so often use the iceberg metaphor there. So it's like the part of the ex- of excellence that is visible is um, obviously smaller and less significant. And it, it's the bit we can't see beneath the surface which makes the difference when it comes to enhancing your performance. And that's where I focus all my effort. Yeah, they're the three things that um, <laughs> I think really make, make, make things harder for people than they need to be. So when it comes to self-improvement, continuous improvement, innovation, like, like we're bombarded. There's no shortage of people uh, willing to fill, fill our knowledge gap in that area with quick fixes. Um, the personal development space for me, like, as I was, you know, uh, growing up reading reading around this area, I mean, it, f- it feels like a charged fire hose to the face. Uh, we're bombarded with promises of easy change, like you know, God, whoop bands, aura rings, meditation, bulletproof coffee, challenge you in a Navy SEAL, lunchtime Quidditch sessions, ice baths. It's just it's endless the amount of shit we're told to do. But like elite performance isn't just a prescriptive to-do list of, of, of things. These are, these are all techniques um, that sit at the tip of the iceberg and they're all potentially great habits to form, but never at the expense of the principles beneath the surface, the, the, you know, the fundamental principles proven to drive all elite performance, which you know, hopefully we'll get to talk about today. 
Um, they simply don't have the power. And then the other one there as well, and this one kills me, and it's a really, there's a couple of popular buzzwords going around at the moment. Resilience is, is, is a big one. We've all been, we're all sort of given the mindset advice from expert performers who at the top tend to advise us, you know, they you know, it's all about resilience, never quit, be positive, no pain, no gain. And that advice just, just, it just kills me. It's about as practical as being told to be taller. Um, <laughs> you know, and while those, who excel often exhibit these mindsets like yes we all know that it's, that's not rocket science yes it takes resilience motivation and confidence they're the, they're the products or symptoms of something deeper again the fundamental principles that, that are generating these mindsets are where we need to focus so yeah take ice baths yeah like at times paint on a happy face yeah grit your teeth here and there but those marginal gains and, and mindset advice are not why Elon Musk is is performs at the level he does, or Cristiano Ronaldo performs at the level he does. You know, don't don't expect them to take you to the top. They're they're really marginal gains, one percenters. So 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 focus on them, yeah, but never at the expense of the foundational principles that I'm going to introduce you to shortly. Yeah, I, I like that. You, and this is something I th- I picked up from early on in the book as well is that you know excellence is no one single thing in isolation, which you kind of spoke about there. Absolutely. As you hinted at the principles, it's probably a good time to dive into those. So there's four principles, as I understand it, to optimize performance from a strategic standpoint. Let's just go through those. So I guess starting with number one. Yeah, absolutely. So, so having you know studied these outliers and you know identified those individuals that are performing upper limits of human capability. Um, you know, we've broken broken down um, the causal factors that that generate such elite performance. You know, there's there's there seems to be four key areas of focus. One, probably way more important than most, and that's where we'll start. I'd say that's like the foundation of the um, of almost this 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 iceberg. If you looked at the iceberg, almost as a pyramid, the, the foundational principles right at the bottom. There's the outlier performers tend to align more closely with uh, this one more than anything else. Um, and I, I, I would describe it as performing from your sweet spot. And scientifically, we describe this as self-concordance theory, which is born out of self-determination theory. I'm just going to refer to it as a, as a sweet spot. So, so what's your sweet spot? And just like uh, a tennis racket has a point at which the ball is driven further and faster away um, with greater force than if struck at, at any other point, so do you. You perform from your sweet spot when the goals that you're pursuing align with the qualities that make you unique. Um, and, and this is the essential foundation that all excellence is built from. Like nothing comes before this. Your sweet spot exists at the intersection of three things. So your strengths, your interests, and your values. Um, so in, when we're talking about strengths, we're talking about the things that come naturally to us. So Maybe that's that you you know you dust people in fifteen hundred meters some athletic ability or it could be uh, a cognitive ability like your ability to perhaps tell a tell a story with a swelling dialogue or perhaps you've got laser like attention to detail. Now um, your strengths are going to dictate the role you pursue. So so for instance you want to excel in trading. Well. The, the, the problem with that is that trading is a big. I mean it's like saying I want to excel in sport, right? It's like what sport. And the metaphor here would be like, look, if you've got um, a ridiculous hip to knee ratio and lung, a VO2 max of like 80, 90, which is basically like an absolute engine uh, and you're six foot four, then you've got the, you've got, uh, you've got some strengths that, um, you know, are highly uh, causally linked with um, elite performance in rowing. Therefore, you know, versus say uh, table tennis. So we can optimize the goals you pursue in terms of strengths. And strengths are so important because they dictate your trajectory. So your responsiveness to training. So when we pursue goals that use our, our strengths, we use we um, we experience more eureka moments or like those breakthrough through moments. So if I'm using my strengths more so than maybe, um, or if you're using your strengths, Aaron, more so than me, and you're having two breakthrough moments a day and I'm having one, two, three months down the line, you're going to be so far ahead of me. I'm just never going to catch you up no matter how hard I work or how, how long I try or, or how ambitious I am. Um, so, so when it comes to using your strengths, it really is a case of, of the best get better. And, and of course, the reality is that we can and should try anything we wish to try. 
But real excellence will elude us unless we determine early on uh, those things we have pre-existing strengths for, for and, and then leverage them in our goal pursuits. And that's really important as a trader. I see, I've see. i seen in the past, you know, people that are born to be uh, physical traders, great communicators, organized, incredible attention to detail, um, but they're trying to make it as market makers. And it's just painful to watch because they don't have that sort of pattern recognition, perhaps. So from cognitive abilities, it's really important to map where you, you excel versus the rest uh, in, in those areas and then think, well, actually, where, where's that? What, what style of trading would that be a real asset in? Just like an athlete would. Does, does that make sense? It does make sense. I, I guess if we could just maybe delve into that part a little more, mm-hmm. thinking about this, if there's someone listening to the podcast right now, and let's say they've been trading two years, they're still fairly new to the game, you know, what would, that, what would their discovery process of identifying their sweet spot look like? Like, could you give someone in that position a couple pointers to, you know, identify their strengths, their interests, their values? Yeah, so the strengths, in terms of strengths, the first question to ask is, is a reflection one, a reflective one. Look, look where historically have you excelled versus the rest, uh, uh, you know, throughout, throughout your life? Um, that's an important question to reflect on. The second one would be, where have you, where have you been highly responsive to training? Uh, and also, where haven't you been? Uh, and what's the opposite of that? Um, that will point you in certain areas, and and, and you, you, your aim is to look for you look to look for for where themes emerge and marry them up. The other thing I would recommend is you've got two types of strengths, right? If you're an athlete, you've obviously got the physical aspect, and if you're a trader, you've obviously got the cognitive aspect or, or working in the knowledge working space. Um, but then we all have the personality aspect. So just like an athlete can go and do a, what we call like an anthropometric assessment to see which sports they're suited to. You can go online and do, I've got links in the book and I can forward some to you, Aaron, for readers at the end of like uh, free cognitive testing sites where you can just go on, complete a test battery and it will say, look, you know, versus normal, based on the normal distribution curve, here's where you fall and it will point you in areas. So that's a good feedback tool. And then, and then the other aspect we all share is this personality uh, aspect where, again, I would, I would encourage people to just, again, there's free online tools. Myers-Briggs, I like it. It it's, uh, gets criticized by a lot of psychologists. However, I find it very useful for giving people quick insight that they can leverage and put to work quick. Again, you're going to get a bunch of questions, 40, 50 questions. And to what extent do you agree with the following question? It will spit you out. You'll fall into one of 16 personality types and, and it'll, it, it will, uh, the report will, will show you your strengths and weaknesses. And you really need to make sure you're pursuing goals that leverage your strengths and, uh, and mitigate your, your your weaknesses. So where your strengths are an asset and your weaknesses just don't matter, that's the aim when it comes to strengths. Moving on to the second component of, of, of your sweet spot, when we're talking about your interests, your interests, that's, that's a bit more simple and it should be a reflective one because the interests are, are, are things which, that, that, that you're drawn to like, like a magnet. And the essence there is you don't need to make, motivate a child to play. And that's where interests come in, in this sweet spot. So strengths have given us that nice responsiveness to training and our interests will dictate our ability to engage and put the time in um, that, that, you know, to to disguise the repetition that is required to to excel. Um, And they, you know, when you're pursuing goals that align with your interests, they enable you to become the gym rat. You're first in, last out. And you, and, and you don't, you're not even thinking about it. So in terms of trading again, this is where your strengths might influence the role or the style of trading you're going to engage in. So you're going to be a swing trader, a market trader, directional trader, a broker. Perhaps you're going to work in research. Perhaps you're going to be a physical trader. But your interest might dictate which asset class you work in, whether that's FX, commodities, um, biofuels. I, I mean, I don't know. There, there, there's... Yeah, you know, equities, depending on what your interests are drawn to. Then we go on to values. Um, so values will dictate um, the intensity you bring. You know, you, you, you bleed, sweat, and cry to achieve your goals because doing so fulfills your values. So they're the, they're the things that in the context of your career are most important to you. And that's a simple question you need to reflect on. Is, is that what... In the context of your career now as a trader, what's most important to you? And based on what comes up there will dictate 
perhaps where you work. So again, strengths will dictate the role, interest, perhaps the domain or the asset class, but your values will dictate the, um, the, the company. So uh, are your values aligned with a company like a, a Glencore or, or a Goldman Sachs or a small startup or maybe working independently? And you need to get those things right because there's that synergistic compounding effect, again, between that high responsiveness to trading, that ability to put the time in, and then that, um, that third component, that, that ability to bring the, bring the intensity. Um, and, and, and when you get in that sweet spot and you're pursuing goals that leverage your strengths in areas that interest you, where there's that opportunity to align with your values, what happens psychologically is we unleash um, what we call our predatory, um, predatory circuitry in our brain. So this is, this is, this is psychological firepower that, that, you know, we all know, again, uh, it's not that people lack resilience, confidence, or motivation. A lot of people are just pursuing goals that fail to ignite these things that exist within them in the first place. And consequently, they stay dormant. So again, that's, that's the key thing that, that makes this uh, sweet spot piece so important. Um, and your sweet spot will be as, as unique to you as your fingerprints. Uh, and it's your job to do that research, spend some time there if you really want to excel and, and find out who you are and then make sure you go out there and be it. So this requires shifting from the, 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 this bullshit, you can be anything you want to be, to the more accurate, you can be a hell of a lot more of who you already are. And, and I love the poker analogy here that, you know, the greatest poker players aren't the ones with the best hands, but the ones who can leverage the hands they have been dealt best. And, and that's, that's, the, the, that's stage one. That comes before everything else. That's going to be your biggest lever in terms of maximizing your progress. So that's principle one. And I appreciate I've taken some time to go into that, but it's so important. So I don't feel guilty. <laughs> I was just going to ask you on the, the point about values there, you know, someone who's an independent trader, uh, maybe self-funded at home, or maybe even a, a prop trader within a firm, what would you expect someone in that position to say uh, their values? Obviously, you know, like you said, everyone's values are going to be different, but just generally speaking. Someone who's optimized to be working independently will probably say things like, you know what, autonomy, freedom, um, you know, control over my um, control over my strategy, my risk management. Those things might be important. Um, it could be a bit of strength stuff going on as well. It could be like, look, I'm really introverted and I like, I don't like interruption. I don't like loud trade, trade like trading floors. Um, you know, the the nightmare situation there is actually if you're naturally maybe a bit more extroverted and you actually learn. I, I'm a person who learns through discussion, conversation. So knowing that, I know that or working in isolation on my own, um, as I experienced writing this damn yeah. book, <laughs> is not optimal for me. It's painful, especially during this horrendous lockdown we've had in the UK. I, I, I'm much more effective when I'm in an environment where I have the opportunity to sample my ideas of someone. So therefore, you know that that's that's going to shape the environment or the organisation I might opt to work work in work in or with. Um, does does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. That's that's really good, actually. I think that clears clears that up. I, I, I just I swear to God, like the amount of money and time we spend looking for quick wins. If people can reflect, you know, spend a good hour maybe reflecting on those questions, engaging in those test batteries, and and then just coming back to it each week. You know, your sweet spots. This, you know, it's not it's not a panacea. Like you know, you can. It's not an indefinite route to ultimate virtue, but it's the the, the biggest um, the, the biggest factor. I think that the biggest multiplier for progress, and 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 it, and it's hard to get perfect. And and the message here that I want to make clear is that look, don't don't wait to get it perfect. Just have an idea of where it is or an area to optimize one of those dimensions, if, if something jumps up and you're like, actually, that's definitely a key point, just go with that. And, and your sweet spot sort of um, zeros you in as you go. So as you sort of, again, take that one step and you move sort of a bit closer in towards your sweet spot, you'll start to see another opportunity. And then we can start to leverage that compounding effect. You sort of galvanize your instinct, your, your definition improves and, and you get more feedback. So don't worry about getting it perfect. Just get an idea of, of, of where it might be, then go out and test it. That's my advice in terms of sweet spot. Excellent. Should we jump on to 
phase two? We should. Let's go into that. I believe it has something to do with technical preparation or maybe skill acquisition. Absolutely. So yeah, let's hear that. Yeah. So, so, so sweet spot, right? We're working with a hardware. We're working out what is our hardware. These are the things that are relatively consistent about us, um, our strengths, interests, values. So once we've optimized the goals we're pursuing in that respect, we've theoretically got this technology with it with bursting with potential the challenge now is to upload skill so think of it as like if you're t- if you're you know the, your sweet spot's a bit like finding the most t- functional technology or the, the latest and greatest smartphone well the, the the skill acquisition or technical preparation phase is about right what apps do i need and how do i get the most high performing functional software onto that so that i can start to perform and be effective so this is where I'm going to st- dispel that 10,000 hours myth that I detest because it was just really bad, bad science. Like I, I love a, some of these books written by journalists are just, you know, they're, they're amazing. And I think they're a really good gateway into human performance. But one of the flaws is that when you have journalists writing books about human performance, they inevitably are going to be focusing on like attention grabbing headlines versus, you know, the, 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 the reality or the true picture. Um, And this is a classic example of that. So the study that that statement sort of came from and was popularized was actually on one set of performers, um, one individual, I think there were only about 12 or 14 of them. So one of them actually, their time to acquire expert status was 2,700 hours. Another one was like 27 and a half thousand hours. The mean time was actually around 11 and a half thousand hours. So it, it, the 10,000 hours thing is a load of bullshit in, in that respect, because what we would do in human performance is go to the individual that did that in 2,700 hours and be like, what the hell is going on there? Was it just genetics? Was it the guy who was in his sweet spot? Or was it there were certain mechanisms with the training that they were exposed to that others were? And, and that's what we've done. And that's how they should look at that. So I think it's a really negative message because the, the reality is if it takes you 10,000 hours to excel, um, you've, you've got a really shit methodology and you're definitely not performing in your sweet spot and you're definitely aligned with the principles that I'm about to talk to you about in terms of your training. So it's not the time spent training that matters. It's the time spent training under the principles of what I call three dimensional training. That's the most important predictor of your development trajectory trajectory. So Mate, if it's all right with you, I'm just going to crack through those. And people, what would be useful, I think, is as I go through them, if people sort of uh, reflect on, like, to what extent am I aligned with, with said principle? Of course, yeah. So principle one, start with the comprehensive foundations. And, you know, to be successful, you don't have to do extraordinary things. You have to do ordinary things extraordinarily well. So for example, I'm going to use a sporting example here because I just, I think it hits the point and that's that in in tennis over, I think it's over 85% of points are won through the first serve, return serve and second serve. So if that's the case, then you'd better make damn sure that your training in terms of resources and effort is focused on those three huge levers. But the irony is, well, when you go to most academies, and I know this happened, um, I think, at the LTA, when they did this assessment, they're like, we spend about a quarter of our time training on the, th- on, on the, th- the things that deliver 85% of our results. So again, it links to Pareto's Law, and I think people listening to this podcast will know what that is. But the message is, like, what, what does it take to win? Understand where the, the, your big levers are in terms of um, creating a winning trading strategy and make sure you're focusing there. And you're not focusing on marginal gains, bits and pieces. So that's number one. Once you've got that right, we're gonna you, we go on to principle two, which is essentially practice over theory. So again, like knowing a lot about pianos doesn't mean you can play one. It's what you can do, not what you know, that sets you apart. So so try and make your training or learning, especially if you're you are a theoretical person and you enjoy reading if you want to excel as a trader then you know you need to be putting that theory to practice as quick as possible um so you need to swap that recite repeat regurgitate and you see this at a lot of like trading floors where it's just memorize or recite repeat a uh, a certain strategy and we need to swap that for like think do and produce so again using a different example if we go to like chess now instead of 
having the chess player memorizing opening moves, play them, simplified simulations in problem areas, you know, pausing to engage, uh, have, you know, discuss what's going on, forcing thinking, forcing the, the performer to perceive the market or the chessboard in this context. Um, and then have, you know, articulate your understanding of what's going on. Um, and that's what's going to fuse those neural structures in your brain that, that ultimately skills built, built up on. Um, and it was, you'll start sparking and locking that, that learning. Then, then we sort of move on to principle three. And that's it. That, and this is a really important one. Like it's on you. It's your future, your responsibility. Therefore, you take the lead in it all. Um, and imagine if people are working independently, they're probably already quite good at this. But but if you're in an organization, you want to excel as a trader, then don't expect to just be given the solutions. You need to go out there and find them. When when you're fed the answers um, and given solutions, there's fewer broke through, breakthrough moments that, that fire and wire. Um, our mental structures, which is how our skills are stored in our brain. Um, coaches, trainers on, on, on courses, so on and so forth, they can explain it to, to you, but they can't understand it for you. So you have to do that hard work. You have to spend that time. You know, you're squishing your eyebrows, squishing together. Your blood pressure's going up. You're squinting your eyes, trying to sort of work out and internalize what's going on. Um, and when, you, when you summon your own solutions, the, the practice changes you. Um, yeah, and, and ultimately, advanced skills can't be taught. They must just be discovered by you. Principle four, we need challenge to change. So look, when you increase your demands beyond your current abilities, we create um, what we call a performance gap. And it's exposure to this gap that's a stimulus to adapt to our level. So we call this like the adaptive zone. Um, and, and you need to spend as much time as far into that adaptive zone as you can. That's the spark that's going to activate your genetic potential to uh, essentially expand your capacity uh, and have you adapt to a superior level. Um, obviously, if you're going to the point where you're hyperventilating, then you're in the panic zone and you've gone a bit too far, so come back. But if you're you know, if you're, if you're training or you're listening to a lecture or if you're listening to this podcast even, but you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or what you're going to watch on TV tonight, like it, it, it's not making you better. So just end it. Um, that's a key point. Principle five, if it doesn't happen on the pitch, then it doesn't happen in practice. So again, unless your training reflects the specific skills that are breaking down during live performance, then it just won't make you better no matter how long you do it for and, and how hard you try. So you must identify the problem areas in your strategy or in your performance on a daily basis, depending on what style of trading you're engaged in. Um, and then you've got to focus your areas there. Um, some people like to they get excited about certain areas, like the classic one in sport is, is um, the soccer player who likes to go in the garden and practice tricks. It's like the problem is tricks don't win you matches. So again, it's that linking it back to well, what, what's winning me matches and then where are my obstacles there? Where are my skills breaking down in the market? Uh, and, and there's so many amazing ma metrics platforms you can use in trading to get that, that, that the athletes or other people in the knowledge working world don't have access to. So that's a really important one. Um, I'm nearly there, mate. <laughs> Principle six. Uh, yeah, create uncertainty. So in most fields elite performance is full of potential minefields uh you know the, and the question here is and i see this, this is again perhaps more relevant to individuals in um a fund or, or trading house but like is it reasonable for your to expect your traders to handle um huge market moves in or, or, or positions running against them in a competitive environment if they never experienced them, them in training you know of course it's not so we need to prepare and train in extreme conditions that, that force failure in safe, controlled environments so that we teach ourselves or, or the people we're, we're responsible for coaching to deal with those emotions and challenges and failure that you know, guarantee, you're guaranteed to experience in reality and Jesus Christ in trading more than most areas. Um, and, and the product of that is that you're obviously less intimidated when you encounter them in the real world. So, th so that's another really important one. I understand that's harder to structure if you're an independent trader. But it's certainly not in terms of perhaps running through a, um, what do you call it? A, um, I don't know if you are running through certain scenarios or you're historically looking back at events. Uh, if you're in, do, engaged in event trading, for, for example, 
go hard, go extreme and create pressure. Last principle before I take a breath is variability. And um, this is a key point. Like learning is not mindlessly repeating solutions. It's, it's the mindful search for solutions repeated over and again. So the aim is get it right and move on. Uh, adapt the problem. As soon as you found a solution, change the problem. And this forces you to adjust your skill to the changing uh, situation. Uh, it forces you to perceive the environment, the market. It forces you to, to, to make decisions, engage in pattern recognition, look for opportunities, decide, make, you know, again, make decisions under, and, under restricted timeframes. And, and honing these um, vital components of your skills and perception and decision-making aspects is, is so important. And, and I think a good example for this is um, I, 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 when I have my, my uh, old iPhone, when I was setting it up, you know, the, the thumb recognition? Mm -hmm. You know, when you put your thumb on it, you've got to like, it swirls around on the screen. And it's like, well, if you try to marry, if you just did it once and you had to marry up your, um, your, your thumbprint exactly every time to open your screen, like you just wouldn't be able to deploy that technique in reality. It wouldn't work. And it's the same way when we just memorize, repeat, and we don't have enough variability in our training. We have a very specific solution for a very specific problem. And the reality is the market never presents in those exact conditions. So we must, like that thumbprint, what your iPhone had you do was sort of adjust your thumbprint, take it off, put it back, and it would sort of these red swirls on the screen. And, and what that was, was your phone was almost mapping your thumb as a skill. Um, therefore, whatever angle it comes at you, um, whether that's a trade in the market or your thumb on that uh, phone, you're able to unlock it and, and, and engage to to create a, a result. There was a, obviously a lot of <laughs> <laughs> really awesome tips in there. Uh, one of the things which really stood out to me and I quite liked was the tennis statistic you gave right at the start there. Yeah. Can you just repeat that? Do you have that handy? Yeah. So, so this is a approximately, this is approximation, but I think it's, it's roughly that in tennis over, I think it's over 85%, at least 80% um, percent of points are won through the first serve, the return serve, and the second serve. And the message is that if 86% of the results are coming from those things, then you know, approximately you're going to want to, you want to, you're going to want to like, if I'm going in and I'm assessing someone's skill acquisition program, one of the things I'm going to look at is like, okay, well, are you spending your time and resources on those things that win you, win you results? exactly you, yeah so is it your entry is it your exit is it your trade craft like what depending on your style of uh trading there'll be certain parts of your trade flow process that are break that, that have a disproportionate effect on the ability you know if you maybe perhaps for you it might be if you get your entry right then it's just no worries from then so then god make sure you get that right for other people, it might be about take profit. It's, it, it'll vary, obviously, depending on strategy. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like this idea that it's like we find something which kind of works and we have some success. And and it, I, I think it's like almost a natural human tendency to then want to find something else. Yes. Instead of yeah. just doubling down and trying to see how you can do that, that thing that you've discovered, how you can do that even better. Whatever you're into, I, I mean, I've seen it in trading so much of this. Like, it's very, very rare that a trader's success is built on a, on one or two extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. I swear to God, the majority of successful traders, whether that's like, you know, hedge fund world or like um, a derivatives trading world, most, most people that excel at the top that I've met or worked with are, are the people that master the basics and don't make big errors. It's the errors that kill you. And you, you know, if you're into football or like rugby, again, the best team, the teams that win tend to win World Cups or Six Nations, it's not the ones that have that one moment of genius. It's, it's often the one that doesn't make that one big fuck up um, uh, with regard to the, the, the foundational uh, principles of that craft. Yeah. So let's step forward again. Uh, principle number three. So three, yeah, I'll be quicker with this one. And then people are busy. There's no so, rush. <laughs> so theoretically right now, in our journey, if we've done this right, we've got this individual burst of potential, and then we've had their, their technical preparations second to none. You know, they've been lined with all those principles we've just been talking about. Like they're ready to deploy their technical ability, right? Now, the next thing that can 
come a, a cropper here is our ability to access our technical ability when it counts. Now, essentially, at this stage, it's time to deliver on your sweet spot and all your skill acquisition. And in trading, uh, like most elite performance environments, you need to do that on demand and under pressure. You, you, know, you can't predict when things are just going to crash or move or that opportunity that's there and then gone forever is going to come. You just got to be able to deliver everything you've got in the tank in that moment. So that 10 years of work can come down to 10 seconds. Um, so we're not focusing on getting better anymore, but just delivering on what we've got. Um, and one of the things that outliers do is flick the switch, regulate their emotion and fight the urge to panic. So the good news here is that you can control your emotions because you create your emotions. Uh, your emotions are built by you, not built into you. And in essence, you can develop performance routines that that act as these switches we can uh, we we can flick. And the simple formula there is really that your thoughts plus your actions equals an emotional state. So if you can manipulate your thoughts and the actions you engage in, you can um, you you can dictate the emotion you experience. Now, obviously, when it's time to deliver on demand under pressure. Um, I would describe that as, uh, it, well, in, in sports psychology, we'd call it like a blue head state, a flow state. So you want to feel confident. You want your, your brain flooded with a super sick. So like, like an andonide, serotonin, oxytocin, you know, the brain just giving you all those good chemicals that, that, that create this like chemical symphony of indestructibility. And, and that's where you access absolutely everything you've got in the tank. And that's when you sort of get lost in the moment uh, and, and, and just, it's, it's that, to be honest, is almost what elite performance is all about, like trying to get into that state. So I guess the message here is that emotional control is a skill. And like any skill, you must invest methodology, time and energy to develop and maintain it. And I go into a lot of depth about this in the book. because It is, it is a more complicated subject, but in essence, it's also not rocket science. It's if you manipulate those thoughts, you manipulate those actions. Thoughts plus actions equals emotion. So if you're in a in an emotional state that suboptimal for your decision making in a trading environment, then just write that formula down and go through. Well, what's going through my head there? What am I thinking? What am I doing? And and this is where you'll look at things like your body language, your breathing pattern. Um, and there's certain sports that master this. Um, but yeah, you and then you can by learning about those um how you work here in terms of well look where are those moments where you do keep it together and you're great well what are the thoughts and actions going on there and then how can you create that routine um so that you've got this steps a series of steps that act as a each one acts as like a small win and the great thing about routine is it just it they leave no time for you to get caught up in the moment because as soon as you become aware that you're in a suboptimal state, a strategy could be as simple as three, two, one, like, you know, a distraction countdown, I'd call that. It could be slam the table, state change, stand up, check my posture. So shoulders back, chin high, eyes up, take a few deep breaths and then go back to the problem. It could be as simple as that. It could be go for a walk. It could just be ring a friend. Like you can make these as um, deliberate or vague as, as you like, again, based on your personality and what works for you. But the key thing is you can control it. Um, and you have the option to, and that's what outliers performers do. And a lot of them, not consciously, <laughs> but the good news is you can consciously intervene and take control of that and build that skill. We just tend not to focus our effort on building that, um, emotional control skill, like we might, uh, a, a technical skill. So one of the aspects of this principle you've outlined here, uh, is executing right under pressure mm. in the heat of the moment this is probably something a lot of tra a lot of traders uh i guess maybe newer traders struggle with more than uh, experienced traders but maybe still to yeah. a certain extent you know when they they see something build a robot they, if you can <laughs> <laughs> they it see helps. something they sort of know they should act on it uh but hesitate and kind of miss that opportunity yeah you know, they struggle to execute is really what it comes down to. Yes. How would you, what are some tips you'd give to someone? Obviously it's something you could work on over time, but like, where would you start? Absolutely. So I would start at the foundation of our, of our pyramid or iceberg with concordance, because again, there's a reason this comes third. And that, that reason is that 
if you are performing um, goals that are leveraging your strengths and you're sincerely interested and they're aligning with your values and you've had, you've had the adequate technical preparation, it's very unlikely that this is going to be a big issue. And this is almost, we're getting towards the marginal end, marginal gains, but we're all, we're not quite at the surface of the iceberg yet, but we're getting closer. So if you do those two things well, if your training's designed to expose you to those situations, you should be inoculated to them. The most simple way to deal with this is like, look, if you perceive that the, if the challenge is taking you into that panic state, or what I'd maybe call as like a, a redhead, and, you, and you, you're feeling starting to feel frustrated or anxious, frustrated or anxious, or even angry, um, the best thing to do is just break the problem down. Just literally, whether that's reducing your size, giving yourself more time, um, changing your expectations, reducing them, um, but deconstruct the challenge. You know, break break what's a one big overwhelming thing down into a much smaller thing. If it's because you've got seven positions on, just have one or two. If it's because you've just started uh, applying the same strategy, but within a different uh, asset class or derivative that you don't understand as well, then reduce your size. I think position sizing is really important there. That, that would be my top one. Does that help, Aaron, or is there anything, anything more specific I could add there? No, I think that's fairly specific. I guess uh, the next part is the tip of the iceberg, so principle number four. Well, I'm not going to get at the tip of the iceberg because the tip of the iceberg is just all that be positive, be motivated, no pain, no gain, <laughs> wake up at four o'clock stuff. So we already know that. You guys, are, you know, whoop bands, all that stuff, which is, again, is great, but only never at the expense of what, what, what I'm talking about here. So the last one before we hit the iceberg is, again, you could just describe this as continuous pr- improvement slash innovation. And, and this one for me is really important. Like the reality again, so we think of our journey, we've, we're pursuing the right goals. We're technically, we've been technically prepared to deliver. We're psychologically prepared to access our technical ability on demand, under pressure. We do those three things right. We, we would have had some success, like no danger. The, the issue then becomes we've worked so hard to achieve success. Let's make sure we sustain it once we finally have it. Like no one wants to be the one hit wonder, but so many are. And, and that's because we have these inherent biases that once we almost get to the top of the mountain, um, set in and they can be destructive for us. Um, and, and in, in, you know, it's often referred to as what we call like post summit peril. So, uh, again, when it comes to death rates on Everest, the vast majority occur on the way down. And the point there is that by the time we summit, we're exhausted the temptation is there to just bask in our glory and take in the view at the top. Uh, and the risk is we switch off mentally. We start to take shortcuts, cut corners. Uh, and as a consequence, in climbing, more people die coming down than going up. And there's two biases in particular that make this difficult for us. The first one is what we call like continuity bias. So this causes us to assume that the future will resemble the present. And the effect of this is that we downplay the real risk we face. Um, when threats, what threats exist, when they might strike and how significant they can be. And, and, uh, Jesus Christ, we've had a few of those in the last few years, whether that's like, you know, did it, did the U S predict Trump? Did the EU predict Brexit? Did any of us predict COVID? Oil below zero. Yeah. And, and the reason we didn't is, is because of this continuity bias. Um, so that can be a killer at the top. Um, and then the next one that compounds is the illusion of personal control. And where so many people go wrong, and, and I think it's sad to say, but I think there is a lot of this in, in particularly in the hedge fund space. There's this: we downplay the role of randomness in our success, and we end up thinking that you know we've achieved success, and it's all down to our pure genius, and we sort of ignore that fifty percent tailwind we had because the market was just perfect then. And and the problem is that. Again, just like the continuity bias, it makes us complacent. And when we're complacent, we're vulnerable, like we're there for the taking. Um, so we need to do something about that. Uh, I guess a key point there as well is also that with these biases, the damage is slow and silent. Like you get to the top, everything's going well. And then when these biases set in and they start impacting our behavior, it's not like it affects us overnight. It's again, sort of that exponential progress where that, that or that exponential breakthrough or 
that takes us to the top can sort of spit us out the bottom just as exponentially. It's like a drop of arsenic a day. And then suddenly over a year, two years, whack, we just suddenly crash and, and the results aren't there anymore. And, and then we panic and bring in a, a, an improvement consultant or, or start waking up early or working harder for longer or just sack someone. But reality is that those problems were symptomatic of stuff that happened years ago. Um, so what we do about it, uh, I think the best mentality here, there's four sort of things or principles we can we can align with, or, or especially our mindset, at least anyway, uh, align our mindset with. And the first one is that although we must strive to be number one, never let ourselves get there. So and I think what good organizations do or, or individuals, they have a sort of a clear vision that even when they're at the top, will keep them in second place. Um, and, and the vision sort of, my favorite one here is, is probably um, GB rowing. So the, the great British Olympic team, rowing teams, make the boat go faster. I mean, that acted as a brilliant vision. It's not something you can achieve. Um, it's, it, you can always make the boat go faster. So that's, that's sort of how a vision might keep you in second place. It, it acts as that North Star so the closer you get to it, the higher in the sky it looks. And that's, is that, you know, when we're in second place, we've got that hunger, that drive, that adversity, and, and, it, and it stimulates that, that pressure we need to, to drive continued progress. So I think a clear vision is a really good one. Um, that's like personally I like, for me, you know, it's my job is to accelerate excellence. You know, that's not something I can achieve. There's always ways to optimize how I do that. Step two, I would say, is to... And this is where so many people go wrong. I think we, we, again, it's another bias we have, but it's, we like to jump to solutions. And this is why the reason to reasoning by analogy is such a, a problem. We have a problem and then we see the advert. <gasps> oh, wow. Like bulletproof coffee will solve all my problems. So then we, we jump to that. And we're always looking for that s silver bullet that will wish away our problems. Instead, what's really important is to, develop a comprehensive understanding of that, what it takes to win, and then constantly evaluate where, where you are in relation to that. And before you start engaging in techniques and, you know, development interventions, which, you know, any organization in the world, there's always a million and one things you could do to make it better. The key is, again, to be maximally responsive to change and pick the right thing. And this is why, that firm, re under, uh, firm understanding of where you are now um, in terms of what it takes to win and what generates results for you is so important because the rule then becomes, well, look, if, if what we need to do to innovate and stay ahead of the rest isn't obvious, then the rule there is that we don't understand the problem well enough. And it's way better to say, I don't know, and spend time doing this uh, understand piece than it is to just jump to solutions we need to understand the the problems and, and what holds us back so well that the the solutions fall in our laps so that's the second thing and then thirdly it's like setting a target we need to constantly set targets that the end of the improvement cycle isn't goal achievement the end of the improvement cycle should be setting the next goal because we set that next goal um and even if you're at the top you got you know you got to reflect hard raise the bar and, and that might mean fighting to find competition at some times and you've seen in elite sport how teams like the all blacks or, or the british olympic team um particularly maybe the, the the cycling team that's dominated you know they're not comparing themselves to other cycling teams or the all blacks aren't necessarily comparing themselves to other rugby teams they're comparing themselves to other to the win percentages of other elite sports teams in different sports altogether so they're no longer like, are we the best rugby team in the world? We're like, well, where are we in the terms of our win rate as a sports team? Um, and I think that's another good mindset to have. So we need to swap out that if it ain't broke, don't fix it for if it ain't broke here with a sledgehammer. Set a goal that so stretches us, um, that will uncover obstacles, establishing that performance gap we talked about in the, in the skill acquisition, moves us into the adaptive zone. Um, again, switches on our psychological firepower uh, and we can drive, drive innovation that way. And then finally, the final step there is like, we've got to run experiments, just experimentation. So once we've got our target, we need to sort of start experimenting our way to success. So 
there's a lot of certainty. We can set our vision with certainty. We can understand our problem with a lot of certainty. We can set a target with a lot of certainty. Um, but when it comes to that experimentation phase, suddenly it's like we're, we're working in the realms of uncertainty. We're, we're working in the dark. Um, and this means that, you know, essentially we need to, to, to make a plan. Uh, and again, the rule is, as the saying goes, a, a good plan today is better than a perfect plan tomorrow. And the reason is that as soon as we start experimenting and taking action according to the plan, the learning or innovation process, whatever you want to call it, begins. And that action we take provides us with a reaction. And that means we can stop telling people about our plans and start showing them our results. And, th and this stage will, in will mean failing. And, you know, that's not good or bad. It's just data that, that helps guide the innovation. Uh, innovation. So the, the, the message there is just learn from it. Uh, if the experiment's successful, then wicked, celebrate for a moment. Um, but just remember that the, the end of the improvement cycle is, um, is not success, but that transitional period to the next improvement plan. There's no single point where learning ends and we're left with just excellence. It's a fluid, continual process with no finish line. And uh, yeah, we just need to keep at it. And there we go, Aaron. So if you do, if you do those four things, then you, you get a, the, the probability, uh, you know, the more, more you align with the principles we've discussed there, the higher your probability is going to be of um, success over time. Right. And I mean, there's, of course, other areas we could go into, but I think just running through these four principles which you've outlined is, is just hugely beneficial. So I think we'll leave it there and not overwhelm the audience with uh, any further information. So to wrap this up, you do have a book coming out, which I've uh, sort of referenced a couple of times throughout our chat here. Um, when is the release date? When's that actually coming out? So the book is um, available for pre-order in the next 24 hours. So by the time you're here in this podcast. Yeah, if you listen to this podcast, the book is available for, for, for pre-order and it goes into obviously a lot more depth of the, of the principles we've talked about, along with a lot of other aspects that, that, that really do drive um, elite performance. So yeah, that you, you can order that at your local bookstore, Amazon, so on and so forth. The title is Accelerating Excellence. And my, my website is jamesaking.com. Okay. And do you have a, is the release date scheduled? Like it'll, it's up for um, a pre-order yes, now? Yes, it's up for pre-order and it will be released in uh, inside two months. Okay. So what are we, March now? So March, April, May. Yeah. So Beginning what, of May. Okay. Brilliant. Beginning of May. Oh, yeah. um, and just folks listening, I'll put, uh, if you just want a direct link to that book on Amazon, just for your convenience, just go chatwithtraders.com slash James. That'll redirect you straight to Accelerating Excellence on Amazon. Uh, James, if you know folks listening want to find out a bit more about yourself or follow along uh, with things you're doing or just... Uh, connect with you online some somewhere is um, where, where's the best place to go? JamesAKing.com is my website. James A. King on LinkedIn, Instagram at James A. King underscore. Also, if there are uh, any talented traders out there who have a, a three year track record and are, are interested in professionalizing their approach to trading, I'm, I'm still working closely with Claymore Strategies on Project Thor, where we're looking to identify. Uh, talented traders. Um, so if anyone has uh, 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 is interested in that, uh, feel free to get in touch there at um, info at projectthor.co.uk. Okay. And I'll also throw in the mix here. Uh, we've previously done a podcast a couple of years back, uh, episode 133. Uh, well worth your time to go back and listen to that. And uh, James, I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Aaron. It's great chatting. Um, I, I appreciate I've bombarded people with information here, but I, I hope it's useful. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.